The question is, out of that parable, who enters the kingdom? The good person or the repentant sinner? We all see ourselves as a repentant sinner. The problem with the quote-unquote good person is that the good person can lose faith in the face of evil and worse, not act out at all, not respond uh, in terms of faith and what faith demands. Faith demands ethical and moral action. That leads us to God the Father and the problem of evil in the world. And I'd like to begin where I kind of left off last week, talking about our friend St. Augustine. In the confession, St. Augustine told this story. When he was 16 years old, he was hanging out with his buddies. There's sort of this, I wouldn't exactly call them a hoodlum gang, but, uh, you know, his, he didn't think much of his friends later on in life. But they were all this pack, his posse, if you will. And they see this neighbor's tree, happened to be a pear tree, and they stripped it of its fruit, ate some of it, found it wasn't, you know, wasn't quite ripe enough, and then they let it all rot. Okay? A clear act of juvenile vandalism. What was interesting about him telling that story is he says, that was the worst kind of evil. And you might say to yourself, how can this act of vandalism, this, it, it's stupid and it was destructive, but it only had to do with this one tree and it'll bear fruit next year. How was that the, 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 the worst kind of evil? And he responded, because it was done mindlessly. There was no reason for it. Why did we do it? Oh, just for the fun of it, just for the hell of it. That's why we did it. And if I, I think what St. Augustine takes away from that example, and I think something we should take away, is that any act of evil, whether it's small or large, the reasoning that's given to it is usually ends up being paper thin. It's a veneer of reasoning to something that's mindless. Take, for instance, the great massacres over the last you know, several centuries, even going on today with ISIS. The reasoning behind it, if they were to really look at it, it almost disappears in a puff of smoke. It's that illusion, if you will, what we talked about last week. It's that illusion that evil brings to it. I feel righteous by killing this man because I'm purging the world of this evil subhuman that I see. Mm -hmm. And, and, and as if we go through history, that's going to show up time after time after time again. Now, faced with this, the enormity and almost the irrationality of evil, we, we bump up against the problem of evil. Why does evil exist in the world? As the name of the book, the, the, the popular book several decades ago was, was titled, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Now, there was a philosopher by the name of David Hume, and he lived in the 18th century. And David Hume was a Scottish philosopher, skeptic, and very famous atheist. And he put it as clearly as he could in a challenge to Christians. He's saying, you Christians hold three things at once. There's evil in the world. That's true. You believe in a God that is all-powerful. You believe in a God that is all-loving. And when we look at the notion of God the Father, the, the classic philosophical definition of God is a being that is all-knowing, 
all powerful and all good. He's all knowing. He's um, uh, he's omniscient. He's all powerful. He's omnipotent, and he's all loving. He's benevolent. And I don't know about you, but if I were looking for a philosophical definition of God, the Father, a God that was loving, who loved me unconditionally and was all powerful, working my life, that's it. That's my image of God. He loves me unconditionally, and he is active in my life. That's the kind of God I want to call Father. Now, David Hume said, you Christians can't hold all three of those together. Either, because there's evil in the world, you can't take that away. You either live, you either believe in a God that is all-powerful, but if there's evil in the world, that means that God is, is either evil or responsible for evil. Or you believe in a God that's all-loving, but there's evil in the world, so he's not all-powerful. You can't have it both ways. Now, being a skeptic, he's going to say, there's evil in the world. You can't hold the other two together with that evil. So the idea of God is irrational. But he sort of lays it out in very stark terms. Now, how do we as Christians answer that? A world that's kind of journeying, kind of processing uh, step by step towards ultimate perfection, it towards an end. That end, of course, is life with God, present, perfectly present, sort of at the end of the world. So it's just not us that are being saved, it's the entire cosmos. But he freely created creatures like us who share in part of his image and likeness. His image is the power of free will. We freely choose moral acts within the confines of the limitations in which we were created. There's still space to choose. So we're like God in that aspect. So we're in his image. But we are, are we in his likeness? In other words, do we make choices that are for the good? And that's the challenge that we face. But God created this world so that we could make those choices, so that we could participate with him in the ultimate, uh, the journey towards that ultimate perfection. But the point here is that we have the power to make choices just like God. And we have the power to either improve the situation or destroy the situation, good and evil. At its very core, the Christian faith says, answers the problem of evil by saying, what's the greatest evil in the world? The crucifixion of God's only son. 
What is the greatest good that ever came from that? The resurrection and the promise of eternal life for all of us. In other words, we can participate in a good greater than any evil throughout the world. And that good is eternal life. And it's open to everyone. Now, the crucifixion of Christ is never can never be construed as a quote-unquote good. It just can't. Our evilest acts and the evilest acts of any person in the world cannot be considered good. But the conditions that result from that, as dire as they look, can be the seeds of something better. And that's what God uses. He uses our condition, the way we are, to produce better good. So at its core, as believing Christians, we hold that even though we do bad things, even though bad things happen to us, we can always have hope. And we can always be proven uh, justified in that hope because of what God does. Paschal mystery, the core of our very faith, answers the problem of evil. Out of death came life. What's interesting is that Christianity, in a way, is built upon the problem of evil and answers it by its focus on the cross. By faith in the cross, the wisdom of God, shameful to everyone else, by our faith in God, our faith in the cross, we can see the problem of evil answered. Now, I want to bring back the the parable of the two sons. And just sort of to sum up about good and evil, about faith in the problem of evil in the world. Evil alone is an act of the will. Like I say, the reasoning that we might give to that is paper thin. Because it leads to death and destruction. That's the result of, that's the result of evil. When we choose evil, it's, it's going to somehow destroy our situation in our lives. It's going to somehow bring a little bit of death to our life. But faith is also an act of the will. It steps beyond reason and says, okay, God, I trust you. And so it is faith, not reason alone, that answers the the problem of evil. And that's why why the paragraph uh, 309 in the uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the Christian faith as a whole answers the problem of evil. But you've got to step out of that reason box that sort of Dave Hume sort of set up for us. You got to step outside of it just a little bit and say, God, I trust you to bring me good out of evil, to bring me hope out of my despair. For it is faith supported by reason that gives us a satisfying answer. Back to our friend again, St. Augustine. St. Augustine defined theology as faith seeking understanding, not understanding, seeking faith. Okay? So both the choice that we have between good and evil is one of the will. And it's a choice. If we choose evil, we choose death and destruction no matter how we paper it over, no matter how good it looks. But if we choose faith, we choose a good or a possibility for good that can bring out greater good. The righteous, quote unquote, good or righteous son, he just said, oh yeah, dad, I'll do that. Sure, father, I'll do that. And does nothing. Because if I were to read into the story, I don't know, maybe he just wanted to disobey, but more likely, like the rest of us, he was just lazy. He suffered from sloth. Ah, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. 
But we who are the reluctant children of God are called to do the Father's bidding. We might be called to that. But if we are, our efforts can result in good.